Donald, how have you been holding out in this zombie apocalypse? These slow-ass walkers kind of pale in comparison to the Reaper invasion that I prevented, except now everything smells like a pile of dead bodies. The walkers are so slow, even my geriatric half-asleep ass can avoid them. I don't know how so many characters in Telltale's game manage to let themselves get bit so often. Well, why don't we explore the series and see if we can narrow down what everyone does wrong? Here's a tier list of all of Telltale's Walking Dead episodes. Uh, Barry, I don't think anyone mentioned wanting to rank the episodes. Why do you have this tier list prepared? Shut the f up, Joe. We're starting with episode one of season one, titled A New Day. Yeah, a new day on your way to the state penitentiary. We join up with Lee Everett in the back of a police car. Talking with the old timer here is supposed to be a tutorial, but also we get some basic information on Lee. He's from Macon, Georgia. His parents own a drugstore and Lee is a teacher at the University of Georgia. This is pretty entertaining if you decide to play Silent Lee. The old cop obviously wants to talk, but me, I'm not trying to hear all of that. If you manage to pay attention to the important stuff coming through the radio, you'll see all hell starting to break loose. Cops zooming by and helicopters right after them. This is the America you brought us, Joe. I whoa, now I wasn't the president when these games were made. This one is on Barry. Joe, you're not allowed to disassociate from me when it's convenient you were with me back then. Anyway, the cop here proves to us why people over the age of 80 shouldn't be allowed to drive because this Colonel Sanders looking motherfucker takes his eyes off the road and crashes into a person which sends the car flying off the road into a ditch. One out of five stars, Uber driver talked too much, bro crashed before we made it to my spot. Also, did this cop just not buckle Lee into the seat? Why is he bouncing around like that in the car? I'm surprised Lee was the one that survived the way he flew up into the ceiling like that. As we fade in and out of consciousness, we hear screams and see people approaching us. Eventually, Lee will wake up with an injured leg and now he has to break himself out of the car. We carry on to grab the keys to the handcuff to free ourselves from the corpse of the officer. And apparently Lee has seen enough zombie fiction tropes to know some kind of jump scare is coming. And it does, because the old timer jumps up and attacks us. Thankfully, he left us with his shotgun, so we blow three-fourths of his head off. Poor bastard was just two days away from retirement. As we look around, we pick out a person in the distance. But before we can get some help, the walkers start pulling up on us. And we have to haul ass as fast as we can on this bad leg. Eventually, we make it into a random backyard and some gunshots start drawing the walkers away from Lee. Lee goes inside the house and comes across an answering machine and picks up a message detailing some early events of the apocalypse. A guy named Ed has an incident at a hotel, then they get trapped in Savannah. And the final message is all hell breaks loose and you don't need to be a super genius to determine what happened here. When the message ends, we get a call on a radio we picked up from a small girl in the treehouse we passed before, warning us to be quiet. And this is Clementine. We talked to her for a little while, and then suddenly we're attacked by another walker and we're forced to fight them off. This is like the fourth damn time Lee has fallen over in 30 minutes. This walker is Clementine's babysitter. Well, she was Clementine's babysitter. Anyway, Clem comes along with a hammer, and we use it to bash Sandra's head in. After a brief talk with Clem, you have two options. You can either leave right away while the sun is up, or you can wait until nightfall so you can travel in darkness. If you go during the day, you'll meet up with Sean Green and his best buddy, Chet. If you go at night, you'll still meet Sean and he'll be with a cop friend, Andre, instead. Either way, you escape and make it to the Green family farm. It's worth pointing out that it would be best if you're honest and admit that you're just some guy who picked Clementine up. People will pick up on it if your story is inconsistent. Herschel Green gives us some first aid and starts interrogating us for some reason. This is all a part of a series of checks that determine how Herschel will treat you later. After our brief talk, we'll retire to a barn and when we wake up, we're greeted with our first true friend. This is where we get introduced to our first few members of the motel group, Kenny and his wife, Katja, and their son, Ken Jr. But they call him Duck. Dodging or quacking? Quacking, unfortunately. For some reason, Kenny takes one look at Lee and suggests he's a guy who can knock a couple of heads. I can't imagine why. Barack, I think we all know why Kenny said that. Is it because he's from Florida? Yeah, pretty much. Anyway, we spent some time speaking to Kenny's family and helping Sean Green put together his dog shit barricade to keep walkers out. You'd think a boy who grew up on a farm would be better at handiwork. We split off from Sean and meet up with his father in the barn, and he starts quizzing us on what we've told him up to now. If you've been lying, he'll tell you to get your act together because you'll need other people to trust you. And if you've been giving Herschel an attitude, he'll tell you to watch it. I swear he tells me that every single time I play this game. Before we can keep the conversation up, we hear a scream. And we run out to find that Duck has run Sean over with the fucking tractor 
and now walkers are grabbing both of the boys. Now in a smart and logical world, what you would ideally do is get Duck off the damn tractor and then throw the thing in reverse so it's off Sean's leg and he can drag himself to safety. Instead, the game makes you choose between running over to try to feebly pull Sean from underneath the wheel or punching the walker grabbing Duck. Either way, doesn't matter. Kenny will run up, grab Duck, and leave Sean on his own, even if Lee is trying to help him. Herschel shows up with his rifle and shoots both the walkers, but it's too late. They've already gotten a good taste of Sean. If you tried to help Sean, Herschel will blame Kenny. If you didn't, he'll blame you both. Regardless of what you decided, Herschel will kick you all out, so we head out with Kenny on our way to Macon. This was the first of a series of checks with Kenny to determine whether Lee and him will be good friends in the end. Frankly, you might as well save Duck, even though he's the one who ran Sean over. Sean dies no matter what. Your choices definitely do not matter. All streams lead to the same pond. We make it to Macon and almost get boxed in by walkers, but we're saved by the folks holding up in the Everett Pharmacy. There's a bit of an argument about whether Duck is bit or not, and it's up to Lee to either side with Larry, who wants to kick Duck out, or to side with Kenny and protect Duck. What are we, like 24 hours into the apocalypse or something? There had to already have been something wrong with Larry for him to advocate for throwing an 11-year-old boy out into the street to be eaten. Can't say I felt all too bad for the old man when he started having a heart attack. After we kill a walker that was attacking Clementine, we get a few objectives. Get some gas for the truck and find a way into the pharmacy so we can get Larry some pills. This part of the episode can drag on a little bit in my opinion, but there are some good moments, like finding Lee's father's cane, which he apparently used to beat shoplifters. Speaking of Lee's connection to this place, Carly turns out to be a news reporter and knows all about Lee's crimes. Lee killed a state senator who was sleeping with his wife and advises him to not let anyone know about his crimes so he doesn't endanger the group. Clementine can be around to hear this, and she'll wonder if Lee is bad. Lee will be honest and admit that the guy he killed wasn't a walker. Eventually, Glenn will radio us in and tell us he needs some help. Personally, I would have left his ass at the motor inn. Sucks to suck, bro. See you never. Game does completely gloss over how Lee and Carly get out of the area to the motor inn, but whatever, I guess. When we arrive, Glenn joins us. We need to help some girl stuck in one of the rooms. Bro dragged us all the way over here for a girl. Respect. A little bit of a puzzle here. The goal is to take out all the walkers. And to do that, we first smother one of them with a pillow and shoot it. I'm like 90% sure a pillow isn't suppressing the sound of a gun like that, but all right, pop off telltale. We then roll a car into another walker and then take it out with an ax. Real quick, what's the number one weapon in a zombie apocalypse? A chainsaw. The f are you gonna do with a chainsaw when it runs out of gas? Barack, I assume you have a better answer. Either an aluminum baseball bat or a shovel. Peak answers, I would have also accepted a machete. Machetes are only good if you can keep it sharp. Blunt force weapons are supreme. Anyway, when we cut our way to the room and meet up with the girl named Irene, it turns out she's bitten. Shout out to Glenn doing absolutely nothing to hide the fact that he only came up here to shoot his shot. Jokes aside, this is a pretty depressing moment. Irene here doesn't want to turn and is begging for a way out. Made worse by the fact that Lee can't leave without getting the gun. So he's forced to wait and watch, and then we head back to the pharmacy. Our last goal is working with Doug to get into the pharmacy. Out in the alley, we see one of the employees stuck out in the street, who is Lee's brother. We theorize he has the keys on him, so we turn some TVs on across the street and shatter the glass to attract the walkers. Holy f this game is old. When was the last time you saw a bunch of CRT TVs for sale like that? It's a Super Smash Bros. Melee player's wet dream. Lee makes one final goodbye to his brother. We execute him, get the keys, and run back inside before we get munched on. Unfortunately, nobody stopped to consider that stores tend to have alarm systems in place. So when we open the door, all hell starts breaking loose as the walkers start banging on the building. Tense moment here as we wait for Kenny to pull around with his truck while we're trying to hold the walkers off. Both Doug and Carly end up getting grabbed by walkers, and there's only one person you can save. Back in the day, this decision used to be heavily in favor of Carly, for reasons I'm sure we can all guess. Nowadays, it's become more split. Both have their merits. Carly proves herself to be a sharpshooter, but Doug is adept at technology. I would argue about which one of them is better, but I'm too angry about Larry turning around to try to kill us. Thankfully, Kenny has your back regardless of whether you've been a good friend or asshole to him. The group starts settling in at the Motor Inn. Glenn decides to head back to his friends in Atlanta, and I think we all know how that goes for him. We can thank Kenny for saving us, check on Clementine, who tells us her walkie-talkie is broken, 
Speak to the person we saved back in the pharmacy. And finally, Larry will let us know he's aware of our past. And we better steer clear of Lily. And right on cue, Lily approaches us and thanks us for saving her dad. The group sets up shop at the motel with high hopes. Power finally goes out and we're stranded in darkness, but hey, at least we aren't dug. Not gonna lie, episode one of The Walking Dead might be the weakest of the season. We get introduced to the majority of the people we'll be calling our friends for the next episode or two, and we get introduced into the way things will work for Lee going forward. Unfortunately, this episode is somewhat bogged down by everything you're doing in the pharmacy. Episode one's events seem rather disconnected. First, we're with Clementine, then we're at the farm, then the Everett Pharmacy. And only that leads us to the motel. Doesn't feel like we've got a real cohesive plot for this episode, just a bunch of loosely connected plot lines. For a first episode, it's serviceable though, though I can't say it's something I think back on fondly. A new day is honestly pretty mid, if you ask me. The only good thing about the episode is learning more about Lee's background. Overall though, looking like a mid-episode to me. I'm with the boys here. A new day goes in mid-tier, and now we move on to episode two, Starved for Help. We rejoin Lee three months after settling into the motel on the hunt for some food with a new companion named Mark. Word of warning, don't get too attached to Mark here. They definitely went out of their way to make Mark a more agreeable individual, so we felt bad about what happens next. As we walk, we come across two high school students and their teacher stuck in a bear trap. The black-haired kid, Travis, I think, said some dumb shit like, my dad was special forces on some Navy SEALs copy pasta energy. Anyway, we start trying to help them out of the trap but there's no release on it, so you have two options. Cut his leg off or leave him to die. Just kill me, dog. If I don't bleed out or die from shock, a walker's gonna get me. This event is on a timer or something, so I just eat some snacks and wait for this guy to get eaten. If you do manage to cut Parker's leg off, Travis will vomit, and while distracted, he'll be killed by a walker. If you decide to leave Parker, Travis will reach for Mark's gun and get gut checked in the process, requiring us to bring him along. As we said, all streams lead to the same pond. We make it back to the team and Katja tries to give whoever we brought back first aid. Kenny and Carly have one of their classic arguments about leadership and Lee is stuck in the middle of it. You can try to be a fence sitter, but no one really appreciates that. Lily brings up food rationing and has Lee do it so he can see how she feels doing it. Okay, well, we obviously give food to Clementine. Her favorite is apples, so she gets a slice. I'd give her both if I could. Worth pointing out here that Clementine has lost her hat. That'll be important later. Aside from Clementine, you've got some options. Feeding Kenny, Duck, and Katja will get you on Kenny's good side. Feeding Mark is appealing because he's been somewhat supportive until now. Carly and Doug still stand out, both of them turning down their share of food since Lee saved them in episode one. I can tell you right now that Shipbird Ben isn't getting a single crumb. I mean, you really shouldn't feed Ben because as far as we know, he's not actually a member of the group yet. He hasn't even contributed anything but another mouth to feed. That just leaves Lily and Larry, and while I don't necessarily mind feeding Lily, I prefer to keep the final bit of food for myself. Plus, if you don't feed Larry, he throws an old man temper tantrum. Once the food is given out, Katja tells us the person we brought back lost too much blood and was beyond her care. But then they reanimate and attack Katja. After Lee fights them off, we learn some harrowing news about the apocalypse. You turn into a walker. No matter how you die, you have to destroy the brain first. Everybody is infected. Wait, what about us? We're AI, we can't die. Eventually, a couple of dudes show up at the motel looking for some gas, offering to trade it for food from their dairy. One of them is Andy St. John, and the creepier school shooter looking guy is Danny. After a talk with the brothers, we get our first run in with the bandits who are apparently having an argument over some food. Yeah, unfortunately, one of the guys brought a crossbow to a gunfight. This is some bullshit. We shoot our gun one damn time, and every walker in Georgia comes after us. This guy pointlessly blasts three shots into a corpse and not a walker in sight. Anyway, we make it to the farm. And for what it's worth, the place looks like a sanctuary, not a walker or corpse in sight. The boy's mother, Brenda, comes along and even brings us a basket of bread. I love it here already. The St. John's have a sick cow, and Katja is a vet. So we send the pharmacy survivor back with Ben to go grab her, while Lee and Mark stay behind to help out on the farm and make sure things are secure. Make sure you fix the tire swing so Clementine can play on it later. Anyway, we start walking to the perimeter around the electric fence to push off any walkers that are stuck to them. When we reach the end of it, Mark is suddenly shot by an arrow as the bandits begin attacking us. 
Lee and Mark make it back inside the fence under the cover of a tractor, just in time for the rest of the group to see what happened. We'll say goodbye to Mark because Brenda takes him off to have him help prepare dinner. We get a bit of a hint of some of the underlying tension between Kenny and Lily here. Lily seems perfectly happy at the motel, while Kenny thinks it's inevitable that the group will need to leave. Kenny even floats the idea that we take the farm by force if necessary. Now we're talking, Kenny and I are on that same energy. After spending some time catching up with Lily and pushing Clementine on the swing, we head out with Danny to go teach those bandits a lesson at their camp. When we arrive, the place is devoid of life. But pay attention to some of the things you find in the camp. First, there are boxes from the St. John Dairy here, which seems to make Danny nervous. Then we find a video camera and tell Danny the battery is dead, and he says, Oh, good. That had to tip you off, right? Let's be honest, Danny has been suspect from the moment we saw him. Call it judging a book by its cover if you want, but that boy ain't right. Inside the tent, we come across something strange. It's Clementine's hat, but we don't get much time to think about it before a woman named Jolene pulls up. I wonder if she's the woman Dolly Parton was talking about. Gonna take a wild guess and say no to that one, Donald, but I dig the throwback. Jolene must be crazy. Once again, someone brings a crossbow to a gunfight, and she thinks she'll outshoot both Lee and Danny. Pretty funny when she threatens to shoot both the bros through the balls and string them up on a tree. It would be easy to shoot Jolene, but you should really let her keep yapping because she'll start preparing to spill some information on what the St. John's are apparently going to do to us, something Danny does not like at all, so he executes her immediately. As if Danny couldn't be weirder, he starts talking about Jolene's body as if he were out hunting deer with the boys. Back at the farm, we join up with Clement in the barn with Maybell the cow who's apparently pregnant. You also get to see the infamous salt lick. Don't lick it. It tastes like crap. Joe, how do you know what a salt lick tastes like? I don't know. Anyway, Kenny catches up with us and is suspicious of something behind a door in the barn and plans on distracting Andy while we find a way through. Kenny floats the idea that Lee should pick the lock. When asked why he thinks Lee can apparently just pick any lock, Kenny will say it's because Lee is urban. Give him a break, he's from Florida. It's the least weird thing that could have left his mouth. Lee heads out and sabotages the power generator, causing Andy to come look at it. In the meantime, we open the door and find what I can only imagine is the saw escape room. Andy shows up and catches us in the act and claims that is a room where they butcher animals they hunt. But we all know this is suspect, especially when you get to the dinner table and don't see Mark anywhere. Mark's wound looked like it was painful, but surely it isn't something that would require bed rest. Lee decides to investigate, heading up the stairs and following a power cord to a random closet in the hallway. We plug it in, and a light turns on. Head into the room next door and look behind the bookcase, and behind that door we find... It's Mark, and it seems he's lost a few pounds since we last saw him. We did say not to get too attached to Mark. Mark greets us with three simple words. Don't eat dinner. You don't have to use a supercomputer to process what that means. Goal now is to run down and keep Clementine from eating, which you can easily do. Too bad Duck and Larry just start knocking it back, even after Lee tells Clem to stop. Points to Katya for immediately pulling the plate from Duck on Lee's word. She at least trusts you. Lee brings up a good point. The place is called the St. John's Dairy. Where are they getting livestock to trade with the bandits? The St. John's claim they only go after people who are going to die anyway, but I'm certain Mark's wound wasn't fatal. We try to fight back, but the cannibals are quicker on the draw. They take Clementine hostage, forcing Lee to drop his guard, and we're knocked out. When we come to, we're locked away in a meat cooler of some kind. Larry is beating on the door, Kenny is looking for a way out, and Lily is puking in the corner. Real nice, Lily. You know there's no ventilation in this room. Now we're stuck in here with that. Before we can really start looking for a way out, old man Larry over here works himself up into a heart attack. Lily tries to resuscitate him, but Kenny is ready to write him off as dead and thinks we're about to be trapped with a massively overweight and angry dead guy. The upcoming decision will steer the course of your relationship with Kenny or Lily. If you work with Kenny, you'll restrain Lily, and he'll crush Larry's head with a salt lick. On the other hand, if you side with Lily or don't do anything at all, Kenny will just drop the salt lick on Larry anyway. Some will say you can kind of see Larry's mouth start to move seconds before Kenny turns his head into pulp, though his actual condition isn't really confirmed. Killing Larry will make you and Kenny boys for life. If you don't help, I'm pretty sure your relationship is permanently strained. Either way, with Larry dead, we need to get out of this room. So using a coin which we remove from Larry's pants, we unscrew an AC unit and send Clementine through an air duct to unlock the door. Leaving Clementine alone with Lily, we head out to get the jump on Danny, who's sitting out alone keeping watch. You get to pick from a set of weapons. I'm partial to the heavy-duty stun gun myself. We sneak up on Dan, 
But when Andy shows up, we have to hide. After a few peeks through the door, we'll see Danny leave a bear trap for us to wander into. Once we look again, we'll be greeted with a gun in our face. Here's where helping Lily or Kenny starts to take effect. If you helped Kenny, he'll pull up to help you double team Danny. If you helped Lily, Kenny will legit just sit there prepared to let Lee get killed. And this is why I don't f with Kenny in season one. Lily not jumping to save your life at least makes some sense. You did murder her dad after all. But Kenny is just sitting there prepared to let Lee die just because he didn't take part in killing Larry. Even I'll admit that Kenny is out of line for this one. Thankfully, Lily will pull herself out of her grief and catch Dan lacking. Regardless of who helps you, Danny will find himself caught in his own bear trap. Lee will ready a pitchfork, presumably aiming to kill Danny. Bro starts going on about some, you gotta keep me alive, if you kill me, the meat gets tainted. Like bro, we are not the same. Now this isn't Mass Effect, there is no Paragon or Renegade system to worry about when you make a decision, but there is an eight-year-old girl watching your every move and Clementine will definitely remember that. I'll give telltale points for this one. Death is better than Danny deserves, but for some reason I feel compelled to be on my best behavior around Clementine. When we make it outside, we'll meet up with the pharmacy survivor and Ben, who show up to lend a hand. Small difference here, Doug gets Lee's attention using his laser pointer. It'll be relevant later. Carly reminds us that she doesn't leave the house without that thing on her, and they go around to find a back door into the farm. You'll head towards the house where Brenda will confront you. Bonus points if you try to impersonate Danny, which absolutely does not work at all. When you get inside, Brenda has Katja at gunpoint, and the goal is to slowly force Brenda up into the arms of Mark, who must have succumbed to his missing legs and become a walker. Even in death, that boy Mark had our back. With Brenda dead and Katja safe, we run out to confront the final boss, Andy St. John, who is holding Duck hostage. Kenny ends up getting shot in the side. Thankfully, Carly will take a shot at Andy's ear. Alternatively, Doug will blind him with his laser pointer. Unfortunately, Andy still gets the upper hand on us and attempts to force Lee into the electric fence. This is where Lily refuses to help you if you kill her dad. With Kenny out of commission, Lee will save himself and you can get into a fight with Andy. You can either start beating his face in until he starts looking like Mrs. Puff from SpongeBob, or you can have him tossed into the fence so he gets a taste of his own medicine. Andy will call Lee back to finish what he started and you can either go end him or walk away. And while I would like to go back and conclude things, Andy is already broken. His mom and brother are both dead. Bro is on his knees begging for Lee. We already won. Before the episode ends, we have a few things left to clear up. First, while we're walking back to the motel, we come across a station wagon filled to the brim with food, medicine, and other supplies. Once again, we're faced with a situation where the right thing to do for survival is to take everything. Whoever was stupid enough to leave all this here unguarded is shit out of luck. Damn, Joe, I didn't expect that from such a bleeding heart paragon. Like you said, Donnie, this isn't Mass Effect. Finders keepers. However, Clementine speaks up against this. I'm usually 50-50 on this decision, especially because Clementine gets a neat hoodie when you take from the car. However, you'd do well to remember what you decided to do here because it will come back to bite us in the ass in due time. The last thing we do for the episode is see what exactly is on that video camera we found back at Jolene's campsite, and we see she's been spying on the group for a while. It's likely the loss of her daughter drove her insane, and she ends up wanting to rescue Clementine from the motel group. It's assumed she must have snuck in and swiped Clem's hat at some point. Jolene leaves us on one solid point. It's not the dead you need to be afraid of, it's the living which certainly reigns true after episode one, every single major conflict and threat is usually sparked by a living person and not walkers. Now episode two is where things start to pop off with this season and the series overall, we get a good centralized plot with some decent antagonists to deal with. And just as Jolene put it, this episode sets up that the continued threat for our friends is other living people and not the walkers. I dig episode two, great tension and an actual horrifying threat. You don't need to be a super genius to realize that there's something up with the St. John's, but discovering Mark with his legs missing is still one hell of a moment. Starved for Help is a top tier episode. This episode also sets up more of the conflict between Lee, Kenny, and Lily, which will come to a head in episode three. Moving on to Long Road Ahead, we pick back up with Lee and Kenny back in Macon making a supply run at the pharmacy. Kenny starts floating the idea of leaving the motel and will want to know where Lee stands on leaving. Honestly, both Lily and Kenny have terrible ideas. 
Lily wants to just set up shop at the motel virtually forever, and Kenny wants to pile into the RV and keep driving until they see the Atlantic Ocean. We return to the Everett Pharmacy, but not without Kenny dropping Lee when he tries to get us up onto the trailer. Bro has been skipping arm day. I'm going to guess getting shot in the last episode has something to do with that. Before we can get inside, a random woman comes out into the street screaming and attracts every walker out into the open. We plainly see her get nipped by a walker, so you're faced with two choices. Put her out of her misery or prolong her suffering so she keeps bringing all the dead out of their hiding spots. Shooting her will leave you less time to get your supplies, but keeping her alive gives you plenty of time to make a good supply run. Let's call attention to the absolute bullshittery Kenny will pull here if you haven't been on his side the right amount of times through now. When you're escaping, a bunch of walkers will push a door down on Lee and pin him. If Kenny and you are tight, he'll show up to help Lee. If you aren't cool, Kenny leaves Lee to save himself, damn near looking like he's gonna ditch with the supplies. This is why season one Kenny is pretty annoying. This is potentially the second time Ken will potentially leave Lee to just die, for f all reasons. It's crazy that Lee will just let this slide, but whatever. Once we escape, we make it back to the motel and report to Lily with what we've gathered. Lily will let it drop that she wants to spend the winter at the Motor Inn, which is a pretty stupid idea. I know it's Georgia, but that doesn't mean it can't get cold. Kenny does bring up a good point against staying here. The bandits are giving the group trouble, and when a squad of them come over the wall, it's pretty much GG. Plus, regardless of whether you helped Kenny kill Larry or not, Lily will clearly not have her head on straight, and she isn't making the best decisions. Eventually, Lily will start going on about someone stealing some supplies. Let's not even mince words here. Ben is sitting right there in earshot of everything Lily is saying, and all of us know he's the filthy rat who's been stealing. I gotta admit, I'm impressed. I wouldn't have expected Ben to keep his cool when he knows Lily has noticed missing supplies. Anyway, we've got a slight difference coming up here, depending on whether you saved Carly or Doug. The pharmacy survivor will advise Lee to follow up with Lily on the stolen supplies. But if Carly is the one you saved, she'll also suggest Lee tell the others about him being convicted for murder. Also, apparently, Carly has developed a bit of a crush on Lee. Yeah, all right, man. That kiss on the cheek and whisper to the ear might have been nice if we weren't like three months removed from brushing our damn teeth. Telltale is really glossing over how absolutely filthy everyone is in these games. Donald, I'm telling you right now, that if you keep making me think about the poor hygiene going on here, we're gonna have a problem. It would be a good idea to tell Kenny and clear things up with Clementine. Otherwise, they're going to hear it from Lily later on and that'll further damage your friendship with Kenny. It's pretty funny when you confess to Kenny. First, he'll wanna know if Lee was on his way to jail for touching kids, which is a valid concern to have. Overall, Kenny is pretty cool with things, which I suppose makes sense considering you potentially helped him cave another man's skull in with a salt lick like a week ago. Clementine is pretty understanding of the whole thing. Ben seems as cool as he can be, and Katja isn't even really worried about it, and is more concerned with what Kenny did in the meat locker back on the farm. Back to the investigation of the stolen supplies, our lead is a broken flashlight that someone threw away instead of trying to fix. Worth pointing out that if you helped kill Larry, Lily is prepared to just assume that Lee is the thief, which seems pretty unfair, but whatever. Before we can get to the investigation, it turns out the duck has been eavesdropping and wants to help out. Lee tries to cut him out, but he wants to be Lee's sidekick like Dick Grayson is to Batman. Honestly, I let the kid help, mostly because this is the only time Duck is showing a bit of personality. Boy, I sure hope nothing bad happens to Duck now that Telltale has finally decided to give him a bit of character development. Foreshadowing is a literary device that alludes to a later point in the story. Carrying on with the detective work, Lee will come across some glass and a pink X written in chalk. Then Duck will discover the stick of pink chalk while he's combing the scene of the crime for clues. He'll then want a high five from Lee for the super awesome detective work. Now listen up, I know I'm a cold bastard a lot of the time, but if you leave Duck hanging on the high five, you're an absolute monster. Duck will think you're incredibly awesome. And for as much trouble as this kid has caused, that does warm my heart a little bit. Lee heads out to investigate on his own and discovers a bag of medication in a grate on the wall of the building, taking it back to Lily. She aims to start interrogating the entire group, but not before the bandits show up and take our people hostage clearly upset they didn't get their last shipment. Lee buys some time for Lily to get into position, but unfortunately, all-out war breaks out. So we cover the team while they get to the RV. This is about as much gameplay that these games have right here. Walkers start getting inside as we cover for Katja, Duck, and Clementine. 
and a walker causes Katja to bang her head, but they manage to make it onto the RV. With Lily being the last one on, we leave the motel behind and hit the road. Definitely not the most ideal departure. All our fucking supplies are still back there. Now we face a bit of a problem. We need to know who is giving out our supplies. If you save Carly in episode one, she is the first person Lily suspects. If you save Doug, Lily will hone in on Ben instead. Worth pointing out that the first thing that Shepard says is, I'm sorry. And I'm like, sorry for what? Feeling guilty or something? Notice how Carly has zero issue saying it wasn't her. But when Lily starts pressing, Ben bro can't say a word. Donald is right. On a repeat playthrough, it becomes pretty clear that Ben is guilty based on what he's saying. You could chalk that up to him being a nervous teenager, but bro is putting out crazy vibes right now. We run into a walker and need to stop. So while Kenny deals with that, we start voting on who did and didn't do it. Notice that Ben all of a sudden doesn't want to do the voting anymore, even though he was the one that suggested it. Damn, Donald, you are oddly good at cross-examining people. Well, when you spend a bit of time in a courtroom, you pick up a few things. Ben goes on to say he'll get more food, medicine, and that he'll do anything to stay in the group. What's the boy bargaining for if he's innocent, hmm? Lily keeps pressing Ben, but Carly has had enough and just starts having a heated yap session aimed at Lily. And let's just say Lily doesn't let that slide. She'll immediately shoot Carly dead when she turns her back after Kenny kills the walker. On the flip side, if Doug is here instead, Lily will aim to shoot Ben in cold blood. But Doug is quicker and he jumps in front of the bullet, saving Ben's life. We're faced with one decision here. Either bring Lily with us or ditch her on the road. Either way, it doesn't really matter in the end. But if you do bring Lily with you, she'll potentially threaten Lee's life, but kick him out of the RV and drive away with it. As I'm sure you know, this isn't the last we've seen of Lily. Whoa, Donald, watch the spoilers, man. Season four came out in 2018, and factoring in that 2020 was basically three separate years in a trench coat. I figure we're well past the spoiler moratorium, Sleepy Joe. When we get back into the RV, Kenny will call us up front and reveal that Duck got bitten when the walker attacked him and Katja during the escape from the motel. Real cool telltale. Make me like Duck for a good 10 minutes and raise his red flag immediately after the fact. Real fucking cool. Anyhow, Katja claims she's going to see what she can do from a medical perspective, but she knows as well as all of us that Duck is on borrowed time. The only person who really has any faith here is Kenny. Lee will tell Clementine that Duck is bit and tells her a story about how his brother almost died. We fall asleep and out of nowhere, Clementine starts attacking us as a walker and, oh, it's just a nightmare. Thanks for that telltale. My heart really appreciated that. We'll eventually come up on a block in the road and it's a goddamn train. So everyone hops out of the RV while Lee and Ben investigate. We'll discover the train is still operational. We'll be able to use it to get straight to Savannah with little resistance. Lee will eventually figure out how to get the train running, which I swear has to be harder than this, right? Once we detach the train from one of the stuck carts, we run into Chuck, who I think was a homeless man before the apocalypse. But maybe I'm judging a book by its cover. Since we're taking his home with us, Chuck will join the group. We don't go for long before Katya wants us to stop. Duck's time is up and he's not too far away from dying. So we head up to the front of the train to confront Kenny and... Time for a WWE Smackdown. In this corner, we have Lee Everett coming out of Macon, the heart of Georgia, a history teacher at UGA. In the opposite corner is Florida Man. Where's my damn boat? Kenny, a fisherman from Fort Lauderdale. Now, I love Kenny, almost like a brother, but you got me fucked up if you think I'm letting bro fold me in a one-on-one. -on -one. Once you kick Kenny's ass or let him blow off some steam by beating Lee, He'll stop the train so we can finally deal with Duck. Kenny clearly isn't strong enough to deal with this, as he keeps hoping and coping that there might just be some way out of this. But there isn't, and Katya knows it. Even though the woman loves her son more than life itself, Kat knows it's time to end his suffering. Keep that I love our son more than life itself line in your head, because Katya literally means it. She and Kenny will take Duck out into the forest, and we hear a gunshot, and Kenny screams. What we find isn't what you might have expected. Katya couldn't bear it. Clocks herself out of life before she dare see her son go before her. Katya was never built for this. She didn't like all the guns and violence back at the motel. If she didn't do it here, something else would have gotten her instead. Now we're faced with one final situation, dealing with Duck, who is hanging on by a thread, it seems. Either Kenny can do it, or you can spare him and have Lee do it instead. Back in the day, I remember hating Duck so much that I couldn't wait for him to be gone. But shit. I wasn't ready to see him go out like this. It is also possible for Kenny to fail to kill Duck himself, and we'll leave him to reanimate next to Katya. Regardless, when this is all said and done, 
We'll get back on the train and keep trucking to Savannah. But not before finding out that Chuck apparently told Clementine that she was going to end up like Duck, which I get was Chuck's way of saying we needed to prepare Clementine for the future, but Bro could have been a bit more tactful with it. Needless to say that this conversation with Chuck is one of the most impactful moments in the series. Chuck has Lee sit down with Clementine and come up with a proper plan for when we get to Savannah, and has Lee prepare Clem by teaching her how to shoot, just in case something happens to Lee. Plus, we give her the signature haircut she maintains for most of the series. But hold up. On our way back to Clementine, we'll be passing by Ben, and he'll finally spill the beans. As I deduced, he was the rat that was giving supplies to the bandits. How kind of Ben to wait until after Doug or Carly have been wrongfully executed and Lily has been kicked out of the group to say something. So here's the thing with this scenario. Ben was tricked by the bandits who claimed to have one of his friends. They were lying, obviously, but it was too late by then. The bandits were prepared to kill both him and the entire motel group if he stopped. So in a way, Ben's deal bought time for the group. The issue is Ben stupidly didn't immediately go tell Lee that the bandits cornered him and tricked him into sliding them some supplies. If he'd done that, this whole thing could have gone a lot smoother and maybe Lily would have been more willing to leave. So did Ben screw up? Yes, but not for the reason you might initially think. As much as I'd like to push Ben's beanpole looking ass off the train, we've got more important things to do. We'll begin preparing Clementine for her continued survival throughout the game. It's good to see Lee and Clementine actually bonding for once. When you're coming up with a plan, Clementine will want to look for her parents at the hotel they stay at. But if you recall from episode one, we 100% heard their final moments on the answering machine. So agreeing with Clem here is just trying to stay positive. Also, Lee doesn't do half a bad job cutting Clem's hair, even though she thinks she looks like a boy. Nothing good ever lasts, though, because the train runs into the one damn thing it can't plow through, a giant tank full of oil or gas hanging right in the way. While we lament being stuck, we run into Krista and Omid, perfect two new survivors to replace the people Ben got killed. Omid and Krista seem like decent people. Lee and Clem will move to check out the train station to find a solution to our problem. Once inside, we'll see a blowtorch and send Clementine in to get it. A couple walkers will attack Lee, and once he finishes fighting them all, we'll see Clementine trembling with the gun in her hand, unable to shoot. Don't worry, Clem, you'll get them next time. Honestly, probably a good thing she didn't shoot. Probably would have capped Lee by mistake. Not out of the woods yet. Another walker on the other side of the fence with Clementine shows up, so she gets the keys and we save her. Good thing those specific keys went to the door and not, you know, literally anything else. With the blowtorch in hand, we'll head up to cut down the tank, but then Ben will spot a crowd of walkers the size of an average Super Smash Bros. tournament. Smells the exact same, too. No time to waste. Once Omid cuts the tanker loose, Kenny starts the train and the boys have to jump onto it. Lee sticks the landing, but Omid absolutely fumbles and splits his leg open. Krista goes back to save him, and they both chase for the train. Now, it obviously makes sense to save the dude who's limping, especially because Krista proves she's got a pretty decent sprint catching up with the train right before it takes off. One last thing before the episode ends. We're on our way to Savannah talking to Kenny about the plan, and then suddenly Clementine's walkie starts going off. This thing isn't broken. Worse off, some creepy bastard has convinced Clem that he has her parents. Looks like going to Savannah has gotten a bit more complicated. Needless to say, we're looking at a pretty good episode. The setup from episode two is paid off with the living people being the main threat, as opposed to the walkers. The mystery of who's stealing supplies was pretty good too. At first, it might be hard to tell who's guilty, but a repeat playthrough rewards you if you pay attention to how Ben is behaving. And unlike the previous two episodes, there is no happy ending here. It's just sad all around as the motel group is completely obliterated. First, we lose our home and supplies. Then the pharmacy survivor, Lily, is gone, followed by Duck and Katja. This cycle of loss continues well into the series, but this might be the only time it's truly impactful because basically, Everyone who died here were decent characters. Season one continues to be goaded. Long Road Ahead is going into top tier. Another peak episode for this peak season. Next episode is around every corner. The crew arrives in Savannah and we abandon the train taking to the streets. Suddenly someone starts ringing the city bells and the guy on the walkie hits us up again to warn us to get off the street. Right on cue, walkers start boxing us in. We stop to save Kenny and while that's happening, Clementine is left alone with Ben. And what does our seasonal fuck up character do? Does he A, pick Clementine up and run? B, start fighting the walkers? Or does he C, 
Run like a scared little bitch. If you picked anything other than C, you're completely delusional. Thankfully, Chuck shows up and starts putting in work with his trusty shovel. The game doesn't give us a choice here, and we leave Chuck behind and make it into the backyard of a McMansion. First order of business is getting inside through a radio-controlled doggy door. However, we got lucky. Apparently, the owners of the dog buried them out in the backyard with the dog collar on. So we just dig it up to unlock the door. Barry, you have an extremely skewed view of Lucky. Lee is lucky the pup here was pretty decomposed or he'd have needed to touch him to get the collar off. Anyway, Clementine crawls inside and unlocks the door for us. Now that we're inside, we come up with a plan. Krista wants to stay in the house and rest up. Kenny wants to hurry up and look for a boat. And you also have the option to go looking for Chuck. Okay, can we talk about how completely delusional Kenny's plan is here? Savannah is totally deserted and likely has been for months now. Anyone who had a boat took it and ran ages ago. Best bet in a Walking Dead-style apocalypse would be to get as far north as you can and let the cold freeze the walkers. A real talk, if there's a Walking Dead apocalypse, Joe, you better get to nuking every major city in the country. Jesus Christ, Barack, villages in Syria weren't enough for you, huh? Now you want to bomb U.S. soil? I'm just thinking about this practically. There's no fucking way the U.S. Army lost to walkers when we could bomb the ever-living fuck out of the lower 48 in only 24 hours. Suddenly, I'm glad you weren't able to run again, Barry. Moving on, Ben calls on us to check on Kenny in the attic, and when we get there, we're faced with the walker of a boy named Fivel who apparently tried to survive alone. He clearly died of dehydration or starvation since he can barely move as a walker. Just when you thought things couldn't get any sadder, Kenny goes and says, Fivel kind of looks like duck. Well, we already killed one kid earlier today. What's another one at this point? Once we take Fivel, we go bury him with his dog in the backyard. At least he's with his best friend now. While we're filling the hole back up, we just see some dude stanced up outside the fence. Oh, hell nah, it's time to get out of here. Kenny and Lee head off to the bay to look for a boat. And as you might have suspected, there ain't shit there. Well, besides this boat that's half underwater, but Kenny is coping and thinks it's salvageable. Yeah, no, but whatever. Let Kenny waste his time. After a short bit, Lee will see someone come down from a building over the distance, so our dynamic duo get in position to jump them. But then we get slammed by a QTE. More like you get slammed by a QTE. If that were me playing, I would have cleared it. Thankfully, Clementine shows up to stop us from getting folded. This is Molly. She tells us all about Crawford a section of the city that was sealed off and doesn't allow anyone who's too weak into the community. No old, young, sick, or disabled. The only reason Molly doesn't think we're one of them is because we have Clementine. Molly also lets us know she's the one ringing the bells, but she uses them to guide the walkers around the city so she can scavenge for supplies. Enough talk, though. Walkers show up and we need to get moving. Once again, Clementine being a cute kid saves us and Molly decides to help out. Unfortunately, Kenny is the one who tries to pull Lee up and he drops us again. Lee gets boxed in and has no choice but to jump into the sewers to escape. This part of the episode is a bit slow. The goal is to get through the walkers by using the sound of water to distract them. In case you wanted to run looking for Chuck, don't worry, you'll find him down here. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Chuck didn't turn. He guaranteed that himself. Chuck deserved better. Bro came in and became one of the most impactful characters in the series in under an episode's worth of time. We get through and find ourselves in some kind of bomb shelter and we kind of awkwardly barge in on a group of people living down there. Immediately, we've got a gun drawn on us and the lady behind him keeps egging Vernon on to shoot us in cold blood. In Bree's defense, she thinks we're from Crawford, but as long as you're calm and honest, you can talk yourself through the situation on some Naruto sh The people here were from Crawford, though, a bunch of cancer survivors who naturally didn't fit into Crawford's master plan. Ironically, they're actually held up in a morgue. At least there are beds to sleep on. Vernon helps us get back to the mansion where we meet back up with Molly. We leave Vernon to take care of Omid, who is suffering from his leg wound. And then Lee starts running around the house looking for Clem. Kenny is in the living room, drowning his sorrows and Ben is being useless as usual. After running around the house looking for Clem, you'll run outside and she'll bust out of the shed in the backyard. And you're not gonna believe what's in there. It's a goddamn boat. Okay, setting aside none of us checking inside this shed the moment we showed up. You're telling me for the entire three months that this apocalypse has been going on, absolutely no one in Savannah came to loot this place? It only takes 12 hours of a total blackout for people to start breaking into Target. Ain't no way this shed hasn't been broken open. Finding the boat isn't all sunshine and rainbows, though. She still needs gasoline and a battery, but thankfully that's all we need to look for. There's only one place in the city to find those, inside of Crawford. 
So the team plans a mission to break in and find the things we need. A battery, medicine, and some gas. Before you head out, Clementine will want to come. After all, she is a part of the team, right? However, this is going to be a dangerous mission, so you have to choose. Leave Clementine with Omid or take her to Crawford with you. Clementine is holding out hope that her parents are in Crawford. Both options make sense in a way. Leaving Clem alone with Omid, who is injured, doesn't make a lot of sense. He wouldn't be able to defend her if something happens. On the other hand, taking Clem to a place that has a zero children policy is especially risky. The mission will succeed no matter what, so just do whatever you want. Though Kenny pulls us aside and tells us that the boat isn't big enough for everyone. Easy pick, boot Krista, Omid, Molly, and Ben and the trio of Lee, Clem, and Kenny ride out together. I know that sounds cruel, but I think it's worth pointing out that Krista and Omid have been with us for like 12 hours at most. We just met Molly, and Ben is a massive liability. But we'll deal with that issue when we cross it, you know, as long as nothing happens to the boat. What could possibly happen to the boat? It's not like a bunch of cancer survivors are gonna pull up and steal it from us later, right? We arrive in Crawford, and when we're sneaking up on a guy, we find that it isn't a guard, but a damn walker. Crawford is crawling with the dead, so we quickly run inside the school where all the supplies are. This might seem bad, but dealing with walkers is way better than armed guards. Let's be honest, this plan was doomed to fail if we had to deal with living people. Ben is over here talking about some, I got a bad feeling about this. Yeah, Ben, we know you're just waiting to screw something up and don't worry, he will. The gang splits up. Molly and Lee go for the battery. Krista and Vernon head for the medicine. And Kenny goes for the gas with Bree. We leave Clementine in charge of taking care of Ben. When we catch up with Molly, she comes dropping from the sky on some Batman timing and just goes to town on a walker, like she just caught them filling their water cup with Sprite. We head inside the nearby garage to get the battery we need, but the car alarm goes off and the walkers come a-calling, so we make our great escape, but not without Molly calling us a chicken when Lee hesitates to jump to the next building. Who the hell does she think she's calling chicken? I could make that jump, no problem. Joe, I'm pretty sure if you bent your knees hard enough to leap like that, your legs would turn to dust. And I'm pretty sure your fat ass would plummet straight to the ground, assuming you don't fall through the roof. Good to see you two getting along. Back inside the school, we meet up with Kenny and Bree, who are running from a horde of walkers. We help them by sealing the door with a hatchet. Now, class, I want you to write this down in your handy-dandy notebook. This hatchet was left in the door by Lee to keep the walkers from piling into the school. Okay, everyone got that? Good. Our next step is to go help Krista and Vernon, who have been trapped inside the nurse's office by walkers. We found the medical supplies, but they're locked up and need to find the combination to the lock. In the meantime, we'll come across some recorded footage of a doctor's consultation. A woman here has been diagnosed with a bout of pregnancy, and obviously, per Crawford rules, she won't be able to keep the kid. The good doctor here gives her a bit of time to think things over, but we all know how this goes. Side note, the doctor here is the walker we saw Molly going to town on back in the alleyway. So Lee runs out there alone to go deal with it, nearly getting jumped by a walker in the process. We find the walker, grab another cassette tape and a locker combination. Inside the doctor's locker, we find another tape. In the first one, we see the same woman being given the ultimatum, either lose the baby or leave Crawford, and guess what she decides to do? The lady up and decides to shank the doctor, take his gun, and presumably goes on to execute several other people in the building. And that's how Crawford ended up falling. Well, at least Clementine isn't responsible for this community getting nuked. We see the locker combination on this second tape and get all the meds we need. Before you leave, you might want to check the third tape because you'll see that Molly was once a member of Crawford herself. Molly was apparently, let's say, trading favors with the good doctor in exchange for medicine for her sister. My question is, why the f is the doctor recording evidence of his downstairs dealing? Probably because he knew he was calling the whole thing off and wanted something to look at later. On our way back, Molly drops back in and we head back to the classroom, but hold up freeze frame. Class, do you see that? The door from before is missing something that should be there. Can you tell me what it was? Oh, I know, Barry. It's the hatchet Lee put there before. Good answer, Joe. Now I wonder where it could have gone. Don't worry. We're about to find out. As we're walking back, Ben rounds the corner carrying a suspiciously familiar-looking tool in his hands. Wait. That's the hatchet that was stuck in the door handles meant to keep walkers out. And now there's a bunch of walkers pouring out the door and into the hallway. Ben, you stupid fucking shitbird. 
How many fucking times do you need to screw something the fuck up to be satisfied? Do you just like bending the crew over and fucking them in 100 different ways? Or do you have some sick fucking humiliation fetish? Normally, I'm a bend defender, but this one is a pretty big screw up. Anyone else might have stopped and thought about it for five seconds and realized the hatchet was in the door for a reason and would have at least asked about it first. Now back in the classroom, Kenny gets to work getting us into the armory. But guess what? The shitbird here isn't done making the situation even worse. Of all the damn times for Ben to finally come clean about trading with the bandits to Kenny, he chooses to do it while we're busy trying to escape from a horde of damn walkers. And as you might expect, Kenny does not take that lying down at all. I don't really know why Vernon and Lee stopped Kenny. Ben evidently wanted to get his ass kicked. Arguments aside, Bree, who is keeping the door shut, ends up being on the receiving end of one of the most graphic deaths in the series. We make our way to the top of the tower. Vernon calls attention to something about coming into Savannah on the train, but we'll get to that later. The bell starts ringing, and the Walker version of Oberson grabs Ben, and when Lee shoots it, Ben hangs onto the ledge. Welp later, Ben. Have a nice fall, you damn shitbird. Real talk. You can either save Ben or drop him here. Kenny will even come back and give you a questionable look. Saving Ben has no real merit here besides getting to see him stand up to Kenny, though it is morally questionable to drop him, I suppose. Back at the mansion, if you left Clementine there with Omid, she'll have either potentially killed a Walker defending Omid, or locked it in a closet. Like with previous evil decisions, Clementine will not be happy if you let Ben die. That aside, after Vernon takes care of Omid, he'll pull us aside and offer to take care of Clementine for us. No chance in hell, old man. If Molly is still with you, she'll decide to separate from the group here, never to be seen again. One last time, Clementine will want to know if we're still going to look for her parents. You can either be honest and say no, or lie and say yes. Either way, Clementine will start crying and Lee will catch some beauty sleep. And when we wake up, Clem is gone. And now the unthinkable happens. Lee ventures outside the backyard to get Clem's walkie-talkie and the sneakiest fucking walker on the planet pulls up and bites him. Okay, maybe James from season four had the right idea. No way that walker isn't somewhat aware. This walker didn't react to the sound of the walkie, Lee jumping the fence or anything else. This had to be a trap. Honest to God, it doesn't make sense that a walker would just be chilling there. Any walker in Savannah should be on the move because of Molly ringing the bells. I theorize that the stranger somehow planted it there when he showed up to take Clem. Theories aside, your final choice here is to either hide your bite from the team or to show them. You'll then conclude that Vernon must have taken Clem and planned to go get her back. If you hid the bite, Krista and Omid won't join you, but they will come regardless if Clem was left at the house to save Omid. As you might expect, Kenny joining you depends on how often you've been on his side in the arguments throughout the season. Ben can also tag along if you saved him. Kenny won't like this, but you can talk him into accepting it. When you get back to Vernon's hideout, the place is completely empty. It's then that Clem reaches us on the walkie-talkie, and a person who definitely isn't Vernon starts speaking to us. He advises us to watch our tone and pick our next words wisely, and that's the end of the episode. Around Every Corner is a pretty good episode, but seems like a step down from episode two and three, if you ask me. Finally, getting to Savannah is great and all, but there's hardly any real tension going on here, mainly because our only threat is walkers. And most of the time, those are only a problem because of the living people in our group looking at you, Ben. I'd say this episode is pretty mid. It's like one long fetch quest. Go here, get this, then go over here and get this thing. Time for the final episode of the season. No time left. We pick back up where we left off, telling the guy on the radio whatever dialogue option we selected at the end of episode four. Well, Vernon isn't here, and walkers are blocking the way back through the sewers, so our next step is to get through the elevator shaft, but not before Lee starts going through the first symptoms of becoming a walker by passing out. If you have the crew with you, you'll find them getting ready to cut Lee's arm off which is something you can eventually decide to do. Obviously, if you don't cut Lee's bitten arm off, he will slowly start to turn throughout the episode, constantly passing out over and over again. However, if you do cut it off, Lee will stop passing out, but will be leaking his Kool-Aid through the episode. Presumably, cutting Lee's arm off does work, but he starts dying from blood loss towards the end of the episode. When we reach the roof, Lee will use Molly's bell technique to get the walkers moving away from the mansion so we can get back to it. And when we get back, we find that Vernon and his group stole the damn boat. Those goddamn snakes. This occurs no matter who you leave behind. But it doesn't really matter because a whole horde of walkers start coming down on the house. And now we get a pretty tense moment. 
everyone in the group works together to secure the house against the assault of walkers, first barricading the front door and then preparing to make a stand at the end of a hallway. This is the only damn time in the game where ammo actually counts. So when we run out, everyone gets up into the attic. It might appear that we're trapped, but after an argument with Kenny, Lee will toss the bust of some old guy at the wall and reveal that the two houses are right next to each other, giving us a way out. While we work in shifts, we spend time catching up with Omid, Krista, and Kenny. If Ben is alive, he'll just be sitting quietly in a corner somewhere. While Kenny sits with us, we'll notice Krista hesitates to drink, and it's implied here that she's carrying for two. In the next house, we'll come across a couple who took the easy way out of the apocalypse while we're searching for a way out. If you keep pestering Kenny, you'll eventually trigger a little Easter egg left behind by, presumably, the lead programmer of the games, Randy Tudor. Randy, Randy Tudor, Tudor, good man, man damn, damn fine man. man. Powerful, Powerful stash, stash, one, one of, of the greats. greats. Moving on, we plan on using the balcony to jump to the next building, and coincidentally, it's only suitable for four people to cross. So if you happen to have Ben alive here, he'll plummet to his death and be impaled on a piece of the fallen debris with walkers approaching. This will prompt Kenny to jump down and mercy kill Ben, since walkers are his greatest fear. With that, Kenny will be separated from the group, with his fate left unknown. However, if you dropped Ben, Kenny will keep with us for a while longer. He'll end up causing Lee to drop the walkie down a hole in the building. Krista immediately drops down to grab it. We try to pull her back up, but she falls down and wakes every walker in the building. Kenny jumps down and gives Krista a boost, leaving him to deal with the walkers alone. And that's the last of the motel group right there. Come on now, we know Kenny somehow got lucky here. Our final obstacle to the Marsh House is crossing this rusty ass sign over a horde of walkers. It collapses when Lee is on it, and he resolves to just go down and face the walkers alone. After all, he's already bitten. What's he got to lose? And now we get one of the craziest sequences in any of the seasons. Lee, a man armed with death, takes a piece of glass and his butcher's knife and just goes to town on all these walkers. Walking dead zombies ain't shit, and this is proof of it. We finally make it inside the Marsh House and find the room Clementine is in. Before we can reunite with her, we're faced with the guy who's been causing all these problems. This man isn't given a real name. He's only known as the Stranger. And your first time playing this game, you might not have any clue who this plain-looking guy is. Who could possibly have it out for Lee and the gang? Who would possibly be motivated to do this to us? Well, remember that station wagon we found full of supplies at the end of episode two? Not that it really matters what you decided back then. The stranger will be against Lee, whether he agreed with taking the stuff or not. Across the episodes, we were faced with cannibals and bandits. But our final boss here is just a dude who coached Little League Baseball. Lee has the option to spill the beans on the affair his wife had, and how their arguments strained the marriage. The stranger is also open to sharing what happened to his family. He took his son out to hunt and he lost him. So the family went out searching for him and that's when the motel group showed up and stole their stuff and that was the last straw. Bro's wife left with their daughter, but they didn't get far before dying. Is the stranger a manipulative bastard who tricked a kid into running away from her guardians? Absolutely. But is he a monster? Nah, let's be honest here, we kind of screwed him and his family. The stranger will also go on to criticize every decision Lee has made and reveal he's been listening in on walkie-talkie the whole time, but not before offering to take Clementine and take care of her for us. Now this might seem like a decent idea at first. Lee is well and truly dying by this point, and finding Krista and Omid is a pipe dream. And the stranger isn't that bad, right? Yeah, and then Bro starts talking into the duffel bag he has sitting in front of him, which has his wife's severed head in it. Okay, yeah, now nah, Clementine, whack this weirdo over the head with the bottle, please. Lee then fights the stranger and can attempt to strangle him to death. If you succeed, you'll then be able to shoot the guy before he reanimates. If you show mercy, you'll regret it as the stranger tries to choke Lee back but we are not running the fair one here, so Clementine shoots him herself. With that settled, we'll discover that if you're coated in walker guts, you'll blend in with them. So we cover Clem and then start walking out of the Marsh House. As we're walking, we'll finally encounter Clementine's parents who are clearly walkers, but Clem doesn't have enough time to grieve because Lee will pass out in the street. Thankfully, Clem is able to pull him into a nearby building, but it's clear now that Lee is on borrowed time. So our final job is to talk Clementine through her escape. 
first we have Clem handcuff Lee to the nearby radiator, and then Clem has to get the gun and the keys from the undead security guard. Things don't go smoothly, but Lee uses the last of his strength to kick Clem a baseball bat so she can beat the walker. She takes the keys and the gun and has one final talk with Lee, and... Moment of silence, boys. Myself. Great. Good. And also... What? What is it? No, don't worry. All right. Oh, it's you. Me too. As the story goes, that final little exhale from Lee was actually the voice actor crying while he recorded these lines. Yeah, that's, uh, that's real cool, Joe. Donald, are you crying? No, man, f*** you. I just got something in my eye. I need, like, five minutes. I'll be back. Okay, well, we're hit with an end credit theme at the end here. Clementine is alone in some field, seemingly unsure of what to do next. But then she sees two people far off in the distance and they both stop clearly having seen her. And that's the end of season one. No Time Left is without a doubt a peak episode of the series. Season one of Telltale's Walking Dead is what put the company on the map, and this final episode had people shook back in the day. It's no wonder it won so many Game of the Year rewards despite being a point and click game. Looking at episode five on its own, it sets up some high stakes, especially because the goal here is to reunite with Clem, who you have most likely grown to care about by this point. Everything Lee did in this episode was so damn compelling. It's not just Lee. Everyone who's left in the group shows they're ready to step up when it counts. Kenny will sacrifice himself to save Krista or to mercy kill Ben. 
Krista and Omid follow Lee for as long as they can, despite only knowing us for about a day's worth of time. The stranger also delivered as an antagonist. He's not just some evil motherfucker like the bandits or freaks like the St. John's. He's just another survivor. The stranger showed us just how far a good person can fall because of the apocalypse. And it's something we'll become familiar with in the later seasons. Well, Donald is still having his episode, but we still need to get through the 400 Days DLC episodes. Not gonna lie to you, Barry, I need to take a nap. Why don't we do 400 Days alongside season two? You know what, that sounds fine to me, Joe. Everyone stay safe out there, drink plenty of water, and don't forget to sleep. We'll catch you on the next one.